Do you guys want to talk about, there's an, an analogy that you draw in the book to a, a planet called grassland. And let's just start from the beginning. Let's just build an ecosystem from the bottom up and help people understand what cows and grazing animals ruminants do on this planet or a theoretical planet, how they fit into a, a life cycle and kind of build from there. Yeah, well, I'll let Rob um, explain that. We came up with this idea together, I think, like four years ago when we were um, maybe at Polyface Farm. I can't quite remember, but we were trying to think of like, how can we explain to people why biodiversity even matters in the first place and why you want as many different forms of life as possible? And so Rob, like, had this brainchild. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's the only one I've ever had. So uh, <laughs> hopefully it's a, it's a good one. And this speaks a little bit to the challenge that we have. We're basically fighting an asymmetrical war in, in this scenario. Uh, the folks that are advocating this kind of vegan life way, this vegan centric model, it's all sound bites, elevator pitches, moral superiority, meat causes cancer, meat destroys the environment, you're a, you're a horrible, immoral, per, immoral person to eat meat. And it's kind of compelling. It kind of has some legs. It, it sounds really good. There are, there are uh, striking images that can kind of support all this stuff. And then unpacking any one of those statements is a mini dissertation in ecology, thermodynamics, and all this stuff. And so I, I really appreciate the interest that you've taken in this in addition to all your other work. And I know that the folks that follow you do a deep dive on this, but usually asymmetric warfare happens from a small group with relatively little resources and they do really squirrely things to disrupt the dominant paradigm. It's exactly the opposite now. All of the money, all of the power, all of the influence is using asymmetric warfare tactics to try to bury this notion of regenerative agriculture. And so I, I just kind of want to throw that out there at, at the, the start. But we were, we were at this conference, at, I believe at Polyface Farms, and we were just kind of almost looking around for like some extension cords to hang ourselves from the rafters because we were like, how are we ever going to unpack all this stuff? Like it is so complex. There's so much stuff going on. It, it, there's so many different different stories and everything, and all of them are important. You can't have just the health without the ethics and without the environment. Like you can't just make this a, a one-stop shop. It's a, a three-pronged approach that you have to get with this. And so we were noodling and I had this idea about like, well, people just fundamentally don't understand the way a, a basic ecosystem works. And so in the book, and I don't want to give away all of the goods in the book, but it, we make this case that out of the depths of space, somebody notices that a planet is hurtling towards us. And we think that uh, all of life on earth is going to end, but it just happens that this uh, the, this alternate planet earth, it's identical in every way, except it has no life on it. It has oceans and lakes and rivers and streams and all that, but no life. And it just lands in the Lagrange three point, which is exactly opposite the earth in, you know, in orientation to the sun. So it's totally habitable. It's not that far away. And people are like, wow, this is awesome. We got a, we have a second chance. What are we going to do with that? And so some debate ensues and what we end up doing is sending a bunch of grass seed over there. Like that seems like the lowest input deal, um, you know, minimal risk. Uh, the part, part of the planet gets, gets uh, inundated with grass seed, the grass grows, then the grass dies. And so people start asking some questions like, well, what's going on with that? Well, they need soil microbes and, you know, you need some, some actual interaction with animals because that's actually part of the life cycle of grasses. They have to pass through the digestive tract of ruminants to really function in some ways. So then we send grass and cows and the grass grows and the cows grow for a while and then everything dies because the cows outstrip their carrying capacity and eat every damn thing that there is to eat. And so their population collapses and then the whole thing grinds to a halt again. We've, we're left with another lifeless planet. So finally, we have grass and cows and wolves. And finally, we have some semblance of some equilibrium. The cows keep the grass in check while also fostering its ability to grow and do what it should do. 
the wolves keep the cow population in check. So this thing can work, but it's also incredibly precarious because if one little thing happens, if one virus, one bacteria switches some genes and it becomes pathogenic to one of these three organisms that are on the planet, the whole thing collapses. So now we want to have multiple redundancies. We want all kinds of different organisms that can fill major niches and also sub niches within the story. So if something happens in one place, it doesn't catastrophically affect all of this. And you know, and I'm, I'm stoked that you brought up Grass World because uh, many people have said this really solidified this whole idea. And we honestly weren't sure if you know, people are going to be like, okay, those guys are idiots. This, this is dumb, but it, it's actually really resonated with people. And it, it's interesting because this argument for increased biodiversity, people might think that um, using grazing animals wouldn't feed into that, but it's fascinating. The Audubon Society, which has had a pretty long standing contentious relationship or, or attitude towards animal husbandry has wholesale adopted regenerative agriculture because I don't know what the backstory is. And Diana, this would be an interesting thing for us to explore, but I suspect that somebody somewhere got invited to go out to a ranch and this ranch had been using regenerative agriculture and lo and behold, the, the bird species there had exploded because this is what we, what we see when people do holistic management and regenerative agriculture, they think about everything there because if they can do things that enhance the bird species, then they're doing things that enhance both the grass and the cattle. It's beneficial for everything. And now the Audubon society has really changed its position and it is very favorable to the notion of regenerative agriculture uh, outfits like the Savory Institute and whatnot. And this really gives a real world uh, kind of bookend to the notion of grass world that we need increased biodiversity and this increase in biodiversity is literally the, the canary in the coal mine. Like if we're seeing reduction in biodiversity, then we have problems brewing and the row crop centric planet of the vegans model is one that expunges life from the scene and, and reduces it to something that looks incredibly like grass world, which is a precarious thing. It's a stool balanced on two legs. It is not stable. It's very brittle. And we're seeing some of that, uh, you know, come forth with this COVID-19 pandemic and our, our food systems and the processing and, and the, you know, the economic infrastructure. But hopefully that's not too random of a, an unpacking of grass world.